Greetings of peace. Welcome to The Dean Show. Every week we're here enlightening you with our guests that come in, share their stories, and my next guest coming out in a second, eight years he spent in the monastery. Before that, he was an atheist. He denied God. And then he went through the whole party phase, hanging out at the clubs, doing what men do, you know, nowadays just chasing all the worldly things. And he's here with us today to talk about the transitions that he made in life and how he's gotten on the Dean Show today on this new way of life, this way of life that brings peace, prosperity in this life, satisfaction in the soul. He's got it, and he's here to share his story with us. So you can get it too here on the Dean Show with my next guest, Sicilian. That's right. We're going to ask him if he knows Michael Corleone because the man is obviously someone who's from the Sicilian background. And so we got a lot to talk to him about when we come back here on the Dean Show. Don't go anywhere. This is the Dean, the Dean this is the 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 Peace be with you. Salam alaikum. Salam. Michael Cicerno, De Cerno. De Cerno. De Cerno. So I was, I, as I was opening up at the end, I, for, I forgot to mention from, I, I mentioned from Sicily. Sicily. You were born in... No, America. Born in, in America. America. But my family is Sicilian. Okay. Did you know Marco Corleone? No, never. never. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about from <laughs> yes. the Godfather? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now that's right away a big misconception because as soon as you say, uh, uh, you know, people confuse the two. It's a uh, Sicilian or Italian. Right away, people are like, okay, these are the mafia. Yeah. How far is that from the truth? As far as uh, Islam and terrorism is from, from the truth. It, that's yes. a good way to start now. Did the same way, you know, all Italians, Sicilians, whatever, they're not in the mafia, are they? Nope. Muslims aren't terrorists. Nope. Yeah, and you found that out. You went through a whole big journey. Where did you start? Where did the journey start? Well, when I was a, a young kid, of course, I, you know, grew up an atheist, born into a Roman Catholic background. Um, as I was growing up, my family never talked about God or you would hear Jesus, but it would be with swear words or curse words. That's about it. But we never went to church. I was baptized. I had first Holy Communion, you know, the sacraments of the church. Those were the only two days I ever remember going to church. But I myself, I never believed in God. Uh, through my teenage years, I, because of my denial of God, I mean, if you don't have God, then you have to be filled with something else. And so throughout my teenage years, what I was doing was filling myself with you know, women, uh, uh, different kinds of drugs, alcohol, the party lifestyle. I wanted to do what I wanted. I quit school in the ninth grade, got a full-time job. My dad told me, well, you want to quit school? You got to go get a full-time job, and then you can quit school. So I went and got a full-time job working as a landscaper, and um, that was that, you know. So I drop out of school, and my life's going even worse. And, of course, I still, I, I never thought of God or prayed to God or thought anything about God or religion or any of this stuff. I do remember a number of times when I found myself in ruts where I would actually curse God. I would actually say things, if there was a God that exists, I hate you or I curse you, things of this nature. So this was my life until 17. And like anything in life, when you do something enough, it gets old. And that's exactly what happened. I got tired of girls. I got tired of partying. I got tired of drinking. I got tired of smoking. I got tired, 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 tired. Everything got tired. Everything became the same old, same old, same thing, different day, and, you know, nothing ever changes. But I wasn't just the normal, uh, I wasn't just the normal rebellious teenager because I took it to extremes. And I found myself in a situation where I really wanted to change when I was 17, but I had no clue how to change. I, had, I knew nothing. I mean, I was, I, I really had no, no knowledge of anything. But there was this one family friend who uh, was, a, of course, a, a friend of my, uh, my, my family, who I knew he had, was in the same situation before. He was an older gentleman. He was in the same situation as I was. And he turned his whole life around, and to this day, alhamdulillah, he's the same way. So I went to him one day, and I asked him, and sometimes he would even say things to me when I saw him, but I wasn't ready to accept. But I came to a point where I dug such a deep grave, I wanted to get out of it. So I went to him and said, what do I need to do to change? And I was really, 
I was embarrassed. I, it took me a while to come to him because I really was humiliated. And he said to me, you got to believe in God. And I told him straight out, I said, I don't believe in God. You can't ask that of me. I'll do anything. Just don't ask me to believe in God. That was the last thing on my mind. And I, he said, not only do you have to believe in God, but you have to pray to God. I said, I don't know any God to pray to. I said, if you want me to pray to God, I said, you tell me who God is. And he said, Jesus Christ is your God and your Savior. And him alone shall you serve. I had heard the name of Jesus, but I knew nothing. Mm -hmm. I had heard the name of Mary, but I knew nothing. So he started directing me towards the right path, but I wasn't willing to accept it. But I went home that night, and I was really fighting the urges to go back to my party life, back to that style, uh, the, everything I knew, the habit that I had got myself into. And I had such a temptation and such a desperation that I was so willing to do anything that I said, you know what, I'll pray to this Jesus. So I got on my knees at my house and I prayed to Jesus. And I said, Jesus, I don't know who you are. I, never, I, 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 don't, I don't know who you are. I don't know what to think of you. I don't even know if you really exist. But I'm, I, I just want freedom and peace and something new. And God honest truth at that moment, nothing happened mystical or no visions or locutions or vi vi visions or signs. But there was a peace that did come over me. And that temptation, re it really went away. So I went to my friend the next day, the gentleman who's a family friend, and I told him, I said, I prayed last night and this peace came over me and it, I think that this is the right thing. I said, but I'm still am not sure about the whole Jesus thing. Who, who, who is he? What can you tell me? So he, we got together and he got me a Bible and he was a Roman Catholic and I was born Roman Catholic but never practiced. So he, you know, he said to me, you need to go to confession because of course the Roman Catholics with their confessions with the priest, he said we need to, uh, Roman, Ca he said we need to, <clears throat> he said we need to, uh, you need to go to confession so that God forgives your sins and you need to start receiving the Holy Eucharist, they call it, you know, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. So I said to him, I'm willing to do it. So he, that very day he took me to a priest who heard my confession and I believe my sins were forgiven. And then he took me to Mass the very next morning, and that was the beginning of that. And my whole beginning of practicing the Catholic faith or Christianity and everything about it. Eight years in a monastery. So at 17 years old, yeah. I went eight and a half years in the monastery. Hold it right there. we yes. got to take a break, and we got more yes. to talk about, a lot more to talk about in this incredible story in your journey with Michael here on The Dean Show. We'll be right back. Please subscribe to The Dean Show. Follow us on our official Facebook and Twitter pages in the links below. Please also help support The Dean Show by making a donation in the link below. Back here with Michael Cecero. Cecero. Cecero, Sicilian. Uh, were you ever in the mafia? No, never. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, tell us now, before we come to the future, let's go back to the present again. So you're living that life that you said that, you know, most people, they live. They, they don't really have a higher purpose. They don't know what the purpose of life is, so they end up just satisfying the flesh. So was there any, at that time, any peace? I mean, were you just, uh, even after fulfilling your desires, were you still despondent, depressed? Uh, oh, no, no peace. Uh -huh. Every day, when you live that lifestyle, every day you wake up with guilt, remorse, regret. In the beginning, it's fun. When you're, when you're a teenager and you're young, it's fun. But then the fun turns into regret, guilt, shame for the things you do. Regret? Guilt. Guilt. And shame. Shame. Yes. So that's the side effect to that temporary fun. That's right. Some uh, minutes of enjoyment, hours. That's right. But then shame, regret. Yes. Yeah. And loneliness. Loneliness. Yeah. Kick in. Okay, so now you meet uh, your friend who... So now, yes, so now yeah. I meet my friend who, uh, you know, brought me to, to the Catholic faith and to practicing. So he said to me one Sunday, he really was in the beginning of my practicing Catholicism. He was very, very, he was there. He was very, very, he was like a, a pillar for me to hold on to. And he said to me one morning, or excuse me, he said to me one night, he said, There's the, would you like to go to Carmel with me Sunday morning? To where? Car it's called Carmel. Uh-huh. And I said to him, what, what time? He said, 7, 7 uh, a.m. I said, why would I want to go to a candy store at 7 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday? You know, who wants to go eat candy at 7 a.m.? He said, no, 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 no. It's a monastery. They're Carmelites. They call it Carmel, but it's a Carmelite monastery. I said, oh, I, didn't, I had no clue what a Carmelite monastery was. 
So he says it's, it's a Carmelite monastery where, you know, where they have mass and everything. They're the nuns and the monks and everything, the priests. I said, okay, I'll go. So I, so I went. That next morning, the Sunday morning, he picks me up. We go. And I'm not going to lie. When I went there, my experience of it was one of a kind. It was unique. To, to this day, I can never forget my, ex, my first experience at this place. The, of course, they're what's called contemplative cloistered. Uh, nuns and they live a silent life, a quiet life, a peaceful life. Just they don't even leave. They stay in there and they pray for the rest of their lives, and then they die there and they don't come out for anything. So when I went there, it was the first time that I experienced the Latin Mass and I experienced, you know, the beauty of Gregorian chant as the church calls it. And there was so much peace that I that I that I found at that moment that even tears came to my eyes because it touched me so deeply. I mean, to the core of my being. And I said to myself at that moment, I said, whatever is here is what I want. It was a humble environment? It was humble, it was humble mm -hmm. gets. A very serene, very peaceful environment. Whatever is here I want, because I never had that peace. So I made it my duty to make sure that I could be a part of this place. So at, in the beginning, I started going there on Sundays. And then eventually they asked me to start doing, uh, volunteering there with work. So I started giving my labors. But then eventually as I'm working in the back, where the people can't go in the back, I mean it's, it's separated just for them. So I'm working there, but I work in the back where most people don't get to ever see. So as I'm working back there, I'm finding myself attracted to this life. Mm -hmm. uh, this silent, cloistered, prayerful life. And I secretly wanted to live it, but I didn't know how to express it. I felt like I was too new, too, too in the beginning, like a baby. I didn't want to jump the gun and say, hey, I want to do this. But eventually, I made a decision that I ex and I expressed that, yes, I want this life. So I said to them, I said, listen, you know, I really I want to be a part of this. So basically, the, after so consulting with the community, I was allowed to come and to live there on, on the grounds, uh, in the monastery, the life of the monk. Um, and I also, and that was at 17, and I also began studying with the intention of becoming an ordained, an, an ordained Catholic priest. So you go first, what's the first step? You become a monk? Well, you don't just become a monk. You, you start living the life, you get used to it, you start adjusting, and then you begin studying. Yeah. So m my studies mainly were self-studies in the actual monastery and as mm -hmm. a monk. So, and I did this life for eight and a half years. And I, you know, eight and a half years? Eight and a half years. Mm -hmm. And it was the roughest of lives. I mean, fasting from September the 14th till Easter every year. Um, how, how, do they, how do they fast? That's very different. It's not, it's not a Muslim fast. <laughs> Actually, when I became a Muslim, I'm, I just thought to myself, yeah, I never fasted before. But their fast consists of you, your main meal is your lunch. But the two meals, the breakfast and the dinner, cannot be the same. They cannot equal or be greater than the lunch that you ate. So you can have breakfast, but it can be something very small, frugal. And you can have dinner, but it can be something like a hard-boiled egg and a piece of bread or a salad. But your lunch is a main meal. But then there's no snacks between or soups or desserts afterwards or anything at nighttime. And it's every single day of the year. So we would wake up every morning around 4 a.m. And we would pray and work and study all day long from 4 a.m. until 10 p.m. every single day. What does the typical prayer consist of and how do you pray? Well, of course, the church has what's called the canonical breviary, which, of course, they pray seven times a day. And the reason they pray seven times a day is because David says in the book of Psalms, in the Bible, that the just man prays seven times a day. So the Jews, they picked up the habit of praying seven times a day because David said the just man prays seven times a day. So the church took that, 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 that because the, church, the early church was Jews, and they took the, uh, that Davidic theology, we'll call it, uh, David's saying in, in, in the Psalms, and so the church has what's called the seven canonical hours. So, for example, they'll pray matins, lauds, terse, sect, known, vespers, and compline. And they're all throughout the day, just like we pray, just like we pray uh, salah. Throughout the different periods of the day, they pray the canonical hours. But that's only for the monks, for the priests, and for the nuns. The lay people don't do this. Yeah. And when you're praying, who are you directing your prayers? Oh, of course, Jesus. To Jesus? What about all the, there's uh, saints also, Mother, yes, Mother to, Mary? Yes, to, to Mary, to Mary, Mother of God, um, to Jesus, to the saints. Every day is a different saint's feast day. Mm -hmm. So every day, the canonical hours, what they would do, 
is they would celebrate Barnabas and they'd celebrate Paul and they celebrate Peter and they celebrate Mary. And then some days were strictly for Jesus. Sundays were Jesus' days, right? And it's funny that seven days in a week and one day was given to actually Jesus, who they believe is God, but the other six were given to all the saints who were just men. So pray, praying to Jesus, uh, the Trinity, you know, praying to Jesus through the Father in union with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. so. uh, did, did you have a lot of different also... Uh, icons and oh, statues. Yes, statues. And the Catholic Church is big for statues and frescoes. Um, and I always had a great uh, admiration for them in those days, uh, and a great love for them. And uh, yes, you would kneel in front of a statue, you would kneel in front of an icon, you would kneel in front of any image. But the Catholic theology behind it isn't because Catholics don't look at it as you're worshiping the statue or the icon, but it's like if you walk in your family's house, for example, and say your parents live in California and you live in New York. You look, you're, you live in New York, you walk in the house, you see your family's picture. What does it do? It recalls to your memory your, your, your lovely mother and father back in California. Mm -hmm. And that's what it was supposed to do. It wasn't supposed to be something that you directed your prayers to a statue, but it was a statue of a woman who reminded you of Jesus, or a statue of Jesus who reminded you of who he is, or a, stat or a statue or an icon or an image of a saint that would remind you of who Jesus is. We're going we're gonna to take off from there when we come back after this break. Don't go anywhere. Here on The Dean Show with Michael, eight years in the ministry, and then he came to Islam. We want to find out why, why atheists to Catholicism, in the, eight years in the ministry to Islam. We're back to finish up the story. Don't go anywhere. Please subscribe to The Dean Show. Follow us on our official Facebook and Twitter pages in the links below. Please also help support The Dean Show by making a donation in the link below. Back here on The Dean Show, so eight years in a monastery, and we talked a little bit about the prayer and how that worked. How, how about confession? Was this a daily thing, weekly thing? Every two weeks. Every two weeks yes. you do a confession? Every two weeks. How does that work? Well, of course, the priest would be on the other side of the confessional, and you could either see him or not see him, but you, you know, of course, the priest, and you would get on your knees, and you would confess your sins to the priest, and the belief is that the priest is there in what they call in Latin persona Christi, in the person of Christ. So when he speaks, it's really Christ speaking, because he's in persona Christi, because of his ordination as a Catholic priest. So, yes, every two weeks I would... It was mandatory to go to confession, and you could even go before that, but every two weeks was the norm to go and have your, your sins uh, cleansed away. But this idea that the church has of kneeling in a confessional, a wood box, and confession to a priest didn't come about until the 13th century. Before that, they, the early Christians, they even had confession, but they would do it openly and in public. But this idea of a Catholic church with a box that people think, this isn't until the 13th century. Uh, what happens if someone brings up to a Catholic the commandment where it says, Thou shall have no other gods except the creator of the heavens and the earth. You shall not bow down or make any likeness to him in the heavens and the earth for sea below. You know, this is clear. But then yes. you have all these idols and icons and statues. What's right. the, what, what do they say to that? Well, when it comes to, for example, the statues, and, you know, of course they know the commandments. But see, the, the way that the Catholic Church justifies having these is because what they say is even though God himself said don't build statues or icons or idols. That's clear, isn't it? That's clear. That's as clear as clear That's gets. in the Bible. That's a very explicit statement in the Bible. But the way they justify it is because God himself, in, in the Jewish Bible, in the Old Testament of the Bible, God himself told the Jews how to erect the tabernacle in the tent. And he said put golden angels and he said to put a golden dove. So God himself was saying, build these golden and these bronze images in the temple for the Jews, the first temple, the first temple. He's telling them to do this. So the Catholic Church justifies their worship of these things, their devotion to these things, by saying, well, if God did it, we can do it. Because another way they try to justify it is, is even though, the first, even though one of the commandments is not to build statues or idols or things, of the, or, or things of this nature, a Catholic will say to you, there's a difference between a statue and a, an icon and an idol. An idol is a god that you're praying to, a false god. A statue is something that calls to memory, as I said. You're not actually praying to that. But the, 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 the pagan is praying to that idol because it, it believes God himself is in that actual 
image. Yeah. But the, the Catholics, because they don't believe God or Mary are actually in the images, they don't believe it's idol worship. Yeah. So, okay, so you go from now we went through the party lifestyle, went uh, also just denying God. At yes. one point, a lot of people, they get so frustrated, they don't have peace and they start cursing God. You even went through that. Yes. Um, and now, how do you take this turn towards Islam? Yes, well... Finally taking your shahada. When everybody asks me that question, there's a long story and a short story, and I'll try to give the short story. <laughs> people can actually, on, on our Facebook, that's how yes. you know, people who, who uh, regularly visit, we actually have your whole story there, or you know, yes. the article. Well, even that article, it is much more detailed, but even the, the details that, that I left out were many. So, long story short, the way that I came to Islam, of course, eight and a half years into the monastery, everything was good. I had the life. I really did. I had no bills. And of course, no wife, no kids, none of this stuff. Not in the future, not then, not ever. Because oh, you can't, right? You can't. It's a celibacy. Yeah. You take a vow of poverty, chastity, celibacy, and obedience. And so in that vow of celibacy and chastity, there is no wife or kids. So but to be honest, because a lot of Muslims, they say to me, you know, how could you do that, you know? But see, the thing is, is that within the Catholic Church, it makes sense. Outside the Catholic Church, it doesn't make sense to live that lifestyle. So I'm living this lifestyle. I'm very comfortable with it. I feel good. I'm feeling positive. Okay. Now, eight and a half years in, one day I had to go to a church uh, near the monastery that I was at. And when I was coming out of the church, I, I, I ran into a Muslim. Not intentionally, just by chance. And when I came out that church, and he was there, and he wasn't waiting, but we just crossed paths. He said to me, you're, you're a Christian. I said, yes. He said, can you help me with something? I said, sure. He said, can you show me where Jesus says I am God? I said, no problem. I've been studying this stuff for eight and a half years. I, 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 th I thrive for these moments. So I open up, I, or sorry, I didn't open up my Bible because I don't have to because it's all in my, in my memory. So I go to different verses of the Bible. Too many for me to quote right now. John 1, 1, different, uh, the Father and I are one. Before Abraham was, I am all the God verses, as we would call them in Christianity. So I spit them off to him, try to give him the context and what they say. And he says to me, and this, this brother actually, come to find out, he was actually an ex-Catholic or ex-Christian who was very knowledgeable of the Bible. And he said to me, but that's John saying, you, you, you know, that's John saying Jesus is God and Paul saying Jesus is God and, and, and Peter saying, but does Jesus say he's God? So I kind of thought it was funny because I never thought about it. You know, when I accepted the Catholic Church and the Christian belief when I was 17, it was because I was desperate for something and they told me this is who God was. I didn't think about it. I didn't even want to think about it. I just accepted it. But this was really, maybe it's stupid me, but in eight and a half years, it was the first time I really thought, does he actually say, does he actually claim this kind of divinity that I give to him? So that night I went home and I really was thinking about it. And as I went through the Bible, my, I was looking for different proofs, I really saw that there is no explicit statement where Jesus himself says in the words that we would say, I am God or worship me, but that everybody else says he's God and worship him. So I met with this brother again, and we started having a dialogue on a regular basis. He gave me a Quran, and we started to dialogue and discuss Christianity and Islam, Mary, Jesus, the saints, everything. Who God is, Trinity, one God, what is it? So we must have kept in contact for probably about three months, going back and forth. I read the Quran cover to cover a couple times. Now what I learned about Islam when I was, a, when I was studying was three things, and this is important. One false God, two false prophet, three false book. Everything's false. So that's all I believed about it. About Islam. About Islam. That was it. Never anything good. Never anything good. But when I opened up the Quran and I started to read it, I started to see some clarity. I started to see, I started to see who God really is. And that the Quran actually was a con confirmation of the books before and a completion. It was a last testament. And so through that dialogue with, the, with, with this brother, I came to Islam, alhamdulillah, two years ago. Because his arguments against Christianity 
were stronger than my arguments for Christianity. And I even came to a point so much, and I have to give a lot of credit to Ahmed Dida, because, of course, the sheikh who uh, does a lot, of course, deceased, but did a lot of dawah work, because when I learned that he was the main, uh, uh, the main opponent of the Christian in, in, in dawah and in, in trying to prove Jesus isn't God and the, the proof of Islam, I went online and started watching him. Not to become a Muslim, but to hear his arguments and to refute them on my own, to figure out how I could refute them. But what I did was, day after day, week after week, and I listened to him for quite some time, month after month of listening to him, his arguments really made more sense mm -hmm. than my own arguments. And his influence and his speech really played a positive role um, in me developing into a Muslim. Mm -hmm. And so through Ahmed Didat and through this brother who really opened my eyes, alhamdulillah, to the truth, and you finally accepted Islam. We, we're, accepted we're, Islam. we're out of time. Tell us now, what, what is it uh, that, that you believe now as a Muslim, in short? What, what is it well, that's so drastically different, or is it really that much of a difference? Well, I believe today exactly what Jesus himself taught. Alhamdulillah. That's exactly what I believe. Because the Jesus that I knew before was the Jesus that the church taught me. But when I went and looked at the Jesus himself, who he says he is, I found that was the Muslim Jesus. The Muslim Jesus. The Muslim Jesus. And that that Muslim Jesus spoke of a prophet coming after him, who of course is Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. And he said, when they asked him what's the greatest commandment, he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. Worship him. That's it. That's it. Worship the The creator. same message as Muhammad, the same message as all the prophets, the same message as Moses. And that same Jesus who, like Muhammad, like the prophets, that same Jesus who fell down in the agony in the garden and put his forehead on that ground. And, and worship you, God. And that's how you pray today. That's how I pray today. And we greet also. We're going to cut out. We have to go. But peace be with you. That's the greeting in the Bible, isn't yes, it? Also. That's right. Yeah. After the resurrection, peace be with you. Peace be with you too. Thank you for being with us yes, on the Dean you. Show. Hopefully we'll have you back, back again so we can talk more thank you. about your books. you got a couple of books also that are out. What, what yes. are they called? Uh, the first one that I wrote was Jesus of the Bible and the Quran, which is a comparative study of is the Jesus that you find in the Bible the same Jesus you find in the Quran or are these two different Jesus, Jesuses? Yes. And which one is the historical Jesus? And the second book is Muhammad, a prophet in the Bible. Because what I notice is a lot of Muslims, they, they, they tell Christians Muhammad's in the Bible, and then the first thing the Christian says is what? Where? And every Muslim, um, I'm not sure, to be honest, I just know that the Quran says it. But I have 50 prophecies, one sp explicitly mentioning the name of Muhammad in the Old Testament, but I have 50 prophecies from the Old Testament and from the mouth of Jesus himself talking about a prophet coming after him, a prophet from Arabia, a prophet from Bakka, which is Mecca in the Bible. And so Muhammad, a prophet in the Bible. Because see, the, the fact is, is that the prophets themselves in the Bible give qualifications and requirements for what a, what, what a prophet is. So like anything, if you qualify, you have to be looked at honestly. And so what I do is I take the 10 greatest qualifications for a prophet, not according to me, but according to the prophets of the Old Testament. And I show from the seerah, from the life of Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, how he fits into all ten perfectly. Mm -hmm. And so if he fits into all ten qualifications perfectly, why do you deny him as a prophet? Mm -hmm. And of course my third book that I'm right, working on right now, inshallah, is Did Jesus Say I Am God or Worship Me? That's clear, and he didn't. He called people to worship the Creator, That's not right. the creation. Thank you. Yes. We're out of time. we got to go. Hopefully we'll have you back again soon. Thank you, inshallah. Yes. inshallah. And like so many of our guests, they go through a phase in life, a transition, chasing the material world, parties, music, entertainment, and they see that this doesn't bring happiness or peace to the soul. And then he went on his search to look for the Creator, to submit to the Creator, and he went through the monastery, and he saw, after meeting a Muslim, that... They raised some doubts, some questions there. And then he actually had a dialogue with this Muslim for three months. And then from there, the proof and the evidence was so overwhelming that his sincerity now forced him to accept this truth. So that is the first quality that we need to have, that sincerity, and that, that earnest desire to really want to do what God wants us to do. And then he became a Muslim, one who did what Jesus did, submit to the will of God, to submit to the Creator, not the creation. And today he was here sharing his story, so I hope you got to benefit from it and you can 
be here with us every week as we share people's stories from all over the world because Islam is the fastest growing way of life. And these are intelligent people. These are people who are using their brains. They're shrewd, they're wise, and they're investigating. So that's the thing that you got to be. Don't follow the negative false propaganda that's out there. Use your common sense, use your logic, and dwell into the Quran. Open it. Get it for free. 1-800-662-ISLAM. If you have any questions, contact us. Contact the Muslims. Sit with the Muslims. And you'll see a whole new world opening up. God willing. We'll see you next time. Until then, peace be with you.